Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second and final lecture in the 1974 Civil Rights Lectures. The lectures are co-sponsored this year by the Notre Dame Law School and the Center for Civil Rights. To welcome our speaker, the Honorable Sergeant Shriver, and those guests participating in the Civil Rights Conference that's being held in conjunction with the lectures, we're honored today by the presence of our distinguished university president, Reverend Theodore M. Hesper. Words are not needed to introduce Father Ted to a Notre Dame audience, and I shan't use them. It's an honor and a privilege to introduce to you the former chairman of the Civil Rights Commission and our distinguished university president, uh, Father Theodore M. Hesper. Thank you very much, Professor Beatty. I had a few words yesterday morning to uh, welcome the people who had come to our conference. And I'm delighted to be here today to welcome all of you, but particularly to welcome to this platform our Sergeant Shriver, the Honorable, and uh, I could call him Ambassador and many other things, and uh, the gentleman, the Mayor of Gary, the Honorable Richard Hatcher, where we're always happy to have with us at Notre Dame and who has come in and out on many occasions and is always welcome here as one of the highlights of Northern Indiana and one of our hopes for the future. The task of welcoming Sarge Shriver to Notre Dame is like welcoming God to heaven. The uh, <laughs> Sarge Shriver has has won about everything that Notre Dame can give. He has won the Patriotism Award, which is given by our senior class. He has won the honorary degree, which the doctorate, which Notre Dame grants on behalf of its trustees and faculties. He has won Notre Dame's highest honor, the Litari Medal. And we've run out of things, uh, practically run out of things to give him, although I understand we have a little memento to give him at the end of this program today. But if, if anyone in the whole world needs to know that he's welcome at Notre Dame, I guess, Sarge, that you're it. The last time I had the honor of welcoming him here, he was here campaigning as the candidate for Vice President of the United States. On that occasion, I remember I said one thing, that we're living in an age of anti-heroes. And that one of the saddest things you can say about most people today, especially, I think, young people, is they don't have all that many heroes. Now, I know that at least for a generation, a decade ago, when I saw a lot more of Sarge Shriver, uh, he was a hero to the extent that the kids in the Peace Corps used to name their dogs after him, and you've got to really be in to get that high. But during that period, uh, Mr. Shriver brought to life the kind of generous impulse of young people that that I've always admired in this university and around the world. And he did it because he himself represented something. He didn't do it just by words, he did it by being someone. And he went on to do it in the poverty program and I had the pleasure also of seeing him do it as ambassador of the United States to France, one of our most important ambassadorial posts. And Sarge is a person who never wants to really lose an opportunity and he Remember, on many occasions, I would call him and say, Sarge, I'm just in Paris for tonight. I wanted to call you up and say hello. He'd say, get over here at 7 o'clock. I'll get a gang together. And he'd have 35 Parisian students and 30-odd expatriate American students. And we'd sit on the floor of the ambassadorial residence, which you never do, and with his kids running in and out in pajamas. And, and we'd have a great conversation in, in uh, English and some mongrel French until about... Uh, normally one or two in the morning. But it was always exciting and he, I think the best thing I can say about Sarge Shriver is that he brings excitement and idealism and vision to every task he does. I called him about this lecture because it was terribly important that having heard from the judiciary in the person of uh, Judge Justice Warren and having heard from the legislative in the person of Senator Hart, we should hear from someone who 
had spent most of his life on the executive side of government and also in private life on the executive side. I don't know many people in the United States that are more occupied or busier than Sarge Shriver, but he didn't hesitate. He just said yes, even though he has to be on his way to Russia tomorrow. He's here today to speak to us on this very important subject. I'm not here to welcome him. This, the mayor, Gary, is going to do that, but I do want to say to him and to all of you that I'm delighted that we can all be together this day on this occasion with this speaker and with, with Mayor Hatcher to introduce him. Thank you, Father Ted. The lecture series, as I indicated, is co-sponsored by the Law School and the Center for Civil Rights. Last evening, Howard Glickstein was on the dais, and today, representing the Law School is Dean Thomas L. Schaefer. Dean Schaefer, as most of you know, is a graduate of the Notre Dame Law School and is, uh, has been instrumental in uh, the development and the sponsoring of this lecture series. He's my colleague, my friend, and uh, I'm happy to present to you, in order to introduce the Honorable Richard Hatcher, the Dean of the Notre Dame Law School, Tom Schaefer. Thank you, Frank. I'm charged with the happy task of introducing the mayor of Gary. Gary was founded in uh, 1906 on dunes and in swamps as a company town for United States Steel Corporation. <coughs> Pardon me. And it has sat there smoking like somebody in the wrong part of the airplane uh, ever since. You remember Professor Harold Hill in Meredith Wilson's play, The Music Man, made, uh, made Gary, Indiana, immortal, but that was only because it syncopated well. <laughs> Professor Hill would never have predicted that Gary, in 19, 1905, was his class, before there was a town there. That was part of the problem. Uh, Professor Hill would never have predicted that Gary, Indiana, would have a black mayor. And few people who have lived downwind, as we have for the last 70 years, would have predicted that Gary would have a leader who had youth and ability and integrity in 1974, but it does. Mayor, mayor Hatcher is an able and experienced lawyer. He is an experienced public official, despite his youth. He's held most of the uh, offices you could expect to hold in local government on the way to a, the mayor, uh, mayor's office in an important city. A prominent political leader in Indiana and in the United States, and a mayor with vision and with hope and I must say, if you can have hope in Gary, you can have it anywhere. <laughs> well, we rejoice in, uh, in Mayor Hatcher's successes over there, and we rejoice in Gary's good fortune in having him as mayor, and I think it's probably perilous to restrict a man of so many talents to any adjective, and so I will just introduce uh, the Honorable Richard Gordon Hatcher. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Schaefer. Uh, it is good to be among friends here at Notre Dame. <laughs> I do want to say that uh, really, I suppose everything in life is a matter of perspective. Uh, over in Gary, when we sit and look at the smoke billowing out of the uh, steel mill smokestacks, we view that as black gold, Dean, Dean Schaefer. <laughs> I am very delighted to, to be here and to have the opportunity to uh, introduce the uh, guest lecturer because uh, 
it is very rare that uh, you have an opportunity to do something uh, that is both enjoyable and you feel is also meaningful. For more than two decades, Sarge Shriver has been a vanguard leader in the campaign to eradicate racial and religious prejudice from this country. His dedication to civil rights and human justice have given him a position in the very first rank among contemporary Americans. Two years ago, he stood besides George McGovern on one of the noblest political chariots that ever crossed this country. And that was certainly the proper place for him to be. The 1972 campaign was unsuccessful because our country could not credit, could not believe men of real moral stature. A decade in the Vietnamese quagmire had debased our minds, unfortunately, and dulled our sensibilities. But that was in 1972. And that was in the era before Watergate entered the average American's vocabulary. And this is 1974. And I believe that as a nation, we are now ready for the Sarge Shrivers of this world. Sarge Shriver was there in 1972 when it counted. <clears throat> I believe that he will be there again in 1976. He'll be there fighting for brotherhood, fighting for understanding between men and nations, because he's always been there. And that fact, that rare commitment, has been recognized for many years. I first met Sarge Shriver when he was director of the Office of Economic Opportunity. We met again when he came to Gary in 1972 as a candidate for vice president. I know him to be a man of uncommon integrity, a man of formidable intelligence, and a man of unquenchable moral stamina. Following his graduation from Yale College and Yale Law School, after a career as a successful business leader and executive, Sarge Shriver agreed to devote himself full time to the cause of human rights. In 1961, he became the first director of the Peace Corps, this country's greatest and most successful human, humane initiative since the New Deal era. In 1964, he took over leadership at OEO, turning a generous, large-spirited idea into a noble reality. From 1968 to 1970, he represented this country as our, as our ambassador to France. Sarge Shriver has served as president of the Chicago Board of Education, president of the Catholic Interracial Council of Chicago, director of the Chicago Council of Foreign Relations, and an active member of the National Council Boy Scouts of America also the Eleanor Roosevelt Memorial Foundation and the Navy League. In recognition of his service in this country and abroad, Sarge Shriver has received numerous awards. In 1957, he won the Chicago Medal of Merit and the Yale Medal. The following year, he was given the James J. Hoey Award from the Chicago Interracial Council of New York. He was lay churchman of the year in 1963, and he was national father of the year in 1964 the same year that he received the Golden Heart Presidential Award from the Philippines. Sarge Shriver was given the Notre Dame Patriotism Award in 1965, as Father Hesburgh has pointed out, <clears throat> and the Philip Murray William Green Award in 1966. Also in 1966, he was granted the Pesamenteras Peace and Freedom Award and the National Brotherhood Award. And two years ago, the National Council of Jewish Women gave him its Hannah G. Solomon Award. Sarge Shriver has received deserved recognition from colleges and universities throughout this country and across the globe. And today, he has more honorary degrees than a centigrade thermometer. <clears throat> and that's fitting. That's fitting because he will certainly be called upon one day soon, I think, to take the national temperature, to feel the national pulse, and to tell us about the moral health of the American state. There are not so many great men at large in the land today that we can afford to overlook any one of them. And there are not so many veteran spokesmen for civil rights and equal opportunity that we can afford to forget the few who have remained faithful throughout the years. When the time comes to select standard bearers for freedom and justice and true democracy, then the time will come for us to acknowledge once again this afternoon's speaker, my good friend, a man who has long demanded that America come home to its destiny, Sarge Shriver.
liked very much. Good friend, Mayor Dick Hatcher, Father Hesburgh, Dean Schaefer, Frank Beatty. What's happened to Howard Glickstein today? Must be here somewhere. The Mayor of South Bend, who's just come, Mayor Jerry Miller, and ladies and gentlemen, I must say it's extremely difficult to live up to a introduction of that magnitude coming from those lips. And I'm very, very honored and pleased and flattered by what you said, Dick Hatcher. I hope that uh, somebody here believed it, although I don't believe anybody actually could. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm a longtime admirer of the mayors, and my admiration was increased recently by the extremely competent job that he did in masterminding and co-chairman, I think, probably, co-director of the meeting of black political leaders in Little Rock. I think that the gathering together of men of the caliber who were at that meeting is a very good sign, as it was last year, for the future political health of our country. I'm delighted that the mayor was there and that he lent his considerable talents to the success of that occasion. Looking out over this audience, I'm acutely aware of the fact that uh, a number of us have been here already once before. In fact, uh, last night, I think we were here for about an hour and a half, you listening and me talking. So if anybody gets tired of hearing my voice, voice just let me know, and I'll be happy to erase 18 and a half minutes of this talk. <laughs> Uh, last night, even though Father Hesburgh wasn't here, I uh, took a little time to praise him in his absence. I hope you'll forgive me if I praise him in his presence, because I certainly don't want to come to Notre Dame without making a special mention and giving special attention and applause and recognition to the man whose name worldwide has become synonymous with Notre Dame. I think it's wonderful that the man in whose honor these lectures are held has lived in the cause of civil rights, the full measure of a Christian vocation. He has been a minister to the nation. He has made God's work on earth truly his own. As chairman of the Civil Rights Commission, Father Hesburgh was a conscience for us all because he used his power in the pursuit of justice, men who abused theirs could not abide him. But we value him for the truth he teaches, not just for the title he had. And I'm heretical enough on this campus to predict that Notre Dame itself will be remembered more in history for victories in the cotton fields than even in the cotton bowl. Yesterday, I devoted most of the time I had to anecdotes, I was told to do that, and a little bit of philosophy. I'm happy to say that today at luncheon, a few people claimed that they wished I had talked more about philosophy. I'm not going to burden you with a lot of philosophy, but before I get into the meat of the talk this afternoon, I thought I might just repeat a few of the thoughts that I mentioned yesterday in order to put the context, to put the comments I make today in a context. What I'm arguing for, or was arguing for yesterday, is the necessity for all of us to get our philosophy, to get our ethics organized within ourselves before we launch out into trying to establish policy for others let alone for the nation or for the world. And I argued yesterday that the human rights philosophical tradition needs to be expanded in scope and refined in its structural articulation and then applied within the policy-making processes of our government domestically and internationally. We chatted about that a little bit at lunch today. And in just let's say two sentences, what I mean, rephrasing what I just said, is this. I think that officials in our government have access on nearly all occasions 
to the finest ev advice possible from economists, let's say, from military leaders, let's add, from a council of scientists, let's add, from political advisors, let's add. But practically never do they have any in institutionalized advice from people who could introduce into their decision-making process, into their thoughts, moral or ethical considerations. David Halberstam emphasized in his book, The Best and the Brightest, that nearly every question was asked about our intervention in South Vietnam, North Vietnam War. How much would it cost? How long would it take? How many people would be injured or killed? What chances were there for success in t military terms, political terms? We had every analyst, including psychoanalysts, advising us about what to do. But nobody, apparently, ever asked the question, is it right? Should we do it at all? The ethical assumption was that since it was a part of our national interest, allegedly, obviously it was therefore in the moral traditions or interests of this nation. But trained people in philosophy or ethics were never invited in to the table where the decisions were made. So I'm arguing for the injection into government at all levels, state, local, national, international, the process of uh, introducing into that uh, system ethical considerations. And the one that appeals to me at any rate is the human rights philosophical tradition. And I consider that philosophy just as much at the basis of the civil rights effort domestically as it is at the basis of the worldwide effort for civil rights or for human rights in a vast array of different fields. Fortunately, whether we want to consider it or not, we're going to be forced to consider it. And that's why, in the last two or three weeks, I've become happier than I've been in a long time. I shared, perhaps along with many of you, the feeling that things were in sort of a doldrum, that there wasn't much hope for the future, that everybody was getting complacent and comfortable, and wasn't it great? apathy, they sometimes call it. But I was delighted when the energy crisis came. I was one of the few people, maybe, that really rejoiced in that crisis, even if I had to line up for three hours to get gasoline. And the reason I was happy was very simple. The energy crisis brought home for the first time to the people of this country the question of what you do on a small planet where the total resources are not capable of meeting all the needs of all the people. And let me tell you, my friends, I think that's the f just the first such crisis that we're going to face. There's going to be, in fact, there already is, a food crisis. There are literally hundreds of thousands of people right now starving in various parts of the world. The starvation in Ethiopia is page one but there's starvation in many other places. And an interesting fact is this. We here in America control more percentage-wise of the food production of the world than the Arabs control of the oil production. In other words, how we use our food production for starvation and for hunger to combat it in the world is more important for the world than how the Arabs treat us with respect to oil. There are many other of these transnational, supranational issues coming up besides food and energy. Another one is a very, very arcane, probably distant consideration from lots of people here, but it's the international monetary crisis and trade crisis. I was uh, tremendously interested when just a few days ago a speech hit my desk by Helmut Schmidt, 
the Minister of Finance of the Federal Republic of West Germany. And I'm not going to read you the speech, I'm just going to read you the title. Because lots of times people think that those of us who are worried about food, let's say, are those soft-headed liberals who don't really come down to brass tacks with the hard, tough problems. So this fellow is the Minister of Finance. He's not a liberal kook, a soft, bleeding heart guy. And the title of his talk, in which he considers the problems of international finance, the problems of the international monetary system and trade is this. The struggle, the struggle for the world product, by which he means, for example, energy and food. And the subtitle of it is Politics Caught Between Power and Morals. Let me suggest that's exactly where we are. And I think it's damned exciting. I think it's exciting because the profits of keeping everything quiet and calm, keeping us at the level exclusively of Bob Hope and John Wayne, of keeping all the art on the wall Remington pictures, of watching nothing but Easy Rider, that's over my friends, not because I did anything about it or you did anything about it, but somebody bigger than both of us has done something about it. The crust of the earth, which some people would like to just keep locked as it is, we call it in the old cliche, the status quo, something's happening underneath and the crust is beginning to crack. And the biggest problems of the lifetime of the students here are going to be the problems I've just talked about. International energy, international food, international trade, population, health standards on a worldwide basis, and worldwide pollution. And the wonderful thing about all those problems is that none of them can be solved by an individual nation operating on an individualistic basis, nationalistic, chauvinistic basis. Our president can stand up and say we're going to be energy independent by 1980, and everybody will applaud. We're going to be energy independent. Nobody's going to push us around. The truth is, we can't be. Even if we actually have enough gas for the car, etc., if we have all the energy to keep us energy independent, it's going to mean that places like Japan won't have enough energy to run their economy and they won't be able to trade with us, and similarly with France or Germany. The world is so interdependent now in terms of the physical world, and I'm talking like Helmut Schmidt's talking, the product, that that interdependence is going to require all of you to have a philosophy of human interdependence to go with it. And the only philosophy I know about, and I'm no philosopher, but the one that at least satisfies me temporarily, is the one I alluded to, namely the human rights philosophy, which has the advantage of making it possible for me when I go to Russia tomorrow to sit and talk with a member of the Academy of Science and find out that he is talking the same language I'm talking about human rights. If you will read, as I suggested yesterday, a very small book by, I brought it over here today because somebody asked me the name of it, by Andrei e. Sakharov called Progress, Coexistence, and Intellectual Freedom, you will find a Marxist, atheist, hydrogen bomb scientist saying exactly what last week Father Bernard Herring was telling me in Washington. And who is that? Father Bernard Herring is the former confessor to Pope John XXIII. So I'm telling you something that when a Marxist, atheist, communist, hydrogen bomb scientist is saying what a philosophic ethicist confessor to the Pope is saying, brother, something's going on bigger than any of us in this room. And what it is, is the fact that in the area of human rights and civil rights within the country, you have to apply the same principles that you're going to apply outside the country. Well, enough for the philosophy, too much, excuse me, for the philosophy. But somebody again asked me to talk about that a little bit. You're the victims of it. 
Well, so far in these talks, I have concentrated a little bit on these foundation considerations, which I think we have to get in order before we can tackle the practical problems. I just say I think we have to get our heads screwed on right before we can begin to deal with the practical problems. But today, this afternoon, I'd like to talk about at least a couple of the major challenges in the civil rights area here at home. If we look abroad, for example, to South Africa, and contemplate the denials of civil liberties and civil rights there, I say we must soon turn our eyes back on ourselves, for perhaps with more subtlety, but no less surely, we are creating apartheid here in the United States. And apartheid here, just as much as apartheid there, challenges us once again to perceive and understand our moral interdependence and to act upon that moral philosophy in the human rights tradition. There's economic apartheid in America. In 1969, blacks owned approximately 163,000 businesses in the United States, which grossed about four and a half billion dollars. Spanish surnamed businessmen owned about 100,000 businesses, with gross receipts of about 3.3 billion. Thus, the black population of America, which represents approximately 13 percent of the total population of our country, owned two tenths of one percent of the businesses of America. And these businesses grossed less than five-tenths, just a half of one percent of the gross national product. In the area of unemployment, the rate is still twice as high for blacks as it is for other minorities and for whites. And even in these cases, the statistics just by themselves are not sufficiently revealing because most of the employment that blacks has is at the very lowest level of the economic ladder. In 1960, black families were earning about 54 percent of what white families did. By 1970, fortunately, that percentage had gone all the way up to 60 percent. But the dollar gap, despite the percentage increase, was greater in 1970 than it was in 1960 between black families and white families. So despite what any progress we've made in the economic area, so far as the blacks are concerned, or other minorities, and I'm including Puerto Ricans, Spanish-speaking people from the Mexican tradition, American Indians, and so on, and poor Appalachian whites. Just let get that in there. This is not something just for minorities. Used to have a lot of argue, necessity for emphasizing that in the war on the poverty. 50% of all the people who are poor in America are white people. And they suffer from this economic discrimination, not as much, but significantly, just as the minorities do. Now there's housing apartheid here in America. You hear Nixon talk all the time about the fact that he's against forced busing. Well, my answer to that is I'm against forced segregation. And let me tell you something, there's more forced segregation in America than there is forced busing. This monies which our federal government spends for public housing, just as an example, is spent almost without exception to make certain that the blacks and other minorities stay where they are physically, in the ghetto. And I forget, all you have to do is look at the map of a city like Chicago and see where is all the high-rise public housing. It's built right smack in the middle of the ghetto. How much housing of that type, low cost, public housing was built out in the Winnetka area. Zip, nothing. The people who fled from the cities to the suburbs were all financed, they were subsidized. Most of them have got FHA mortgages on their houses. And so their houses, and, uh, which we all take great pride in, we live in these very nice houses in the suburbs, were all being financed out to those houses by federal money. 
We take great pride in it. That, you know, we pay taxes and we're paying the rent and we're paying the mortgage off. But it's a subsidized mortgage. And the superhighway systems in which we glory, who built them? They're subsidized too. Tax money. Why? So that all the white people can get out to the suburbs. What happens about mass transportation? Do you see any mass transportation to take the people from the central cities subsidized to take them out to the suburbs to go to work in those nice new plants out there? You do not. It was only this year that for the first time any proportion of the money in the highway fund was put aside for mass transit. And if you look around at the mass transit that's being subsidized, you'll find out in most cases it doesn't reach to the suburbs. So I'm not necessarily in favor of forced integration, but I'll tell you one thing I'm against. I'm against forced segregation, covertly, overtly, or any other way. And that's going on in America. There's apartheid in American justice. I assume that nearly everybody here being in the law school knows that an overwhelming proportion of all the people in jail are either black people or Spanish-speaking people or poor people or Puerto Rican people or Indians. I don't think we have to be too bright to know that all those people are not in there because genetically all those people are, have great criminal proclivities. The truth is that they've got no more criminal proclivities than all the white people have got. But the fact is they have been denied from age zero up until they're 16 and 17 the kind of opportunities and they've been subjected to the kind of brutal blows to their psychology and future which almost guarantees that they will go into, a substantial number of them will go into a life of what we call crime. And there's lots of young lawyers, I'm happy to say, in New York and elsewhere, who are rather enraged about the fact that it's very, very easy to get a jail sentence for stealing a $150 automobile, and I mean that literally, a $150 automobile, or two television sets out of a supermarket. You can go to jail for that. But people, some people in very high public office in this country don't go to jail at all for stealing a lot more. When Elliot Richardson made the deal with the former vice president's attorneys, he damn near had a total insurrection in the United States Attorney's Office in Baltimore. Because the men that had found that case and worked on that case were incensed at the differential treatment given to the white criminal for white collar crime, as it's now called, as compared to what happens for the black or minority or poor criminal who has to depend on legal aid services if he gets any legal assistance at all, and who has had the experience for generations of having the book, as the cliche goes, having the book thrown at people of his color or background. And this is not accidental. In the southern part of Texas, on the migrant laboratory stream in this country, today still, but up until very recently, Spanish-speaking child would come to class at, let's say, age six and be slapped in the face if he uttered a word of Spanish. He was required at six, let's say, to learn English. This was part of what we glibly called the Americanization process. I'm in favor of Americanizing everybody we can, but not at the price of brutalizing their cultural traditions and their family life. We didn't do this only with respect to the Spanish speaking, we did it with respect to the Indian people. And I can remember how shocked I was, I didn't know anything about this, how shocked I was when I found out that the Bureau of Indian Affairs with the schools that we built and you paid for on the Indian reservations refused to let any Indian children speak Indian. Refused to let them perform Indian dances or sing Indian songs or learn about Indian history. So that a child grows up 
with an Indian mother and father and at seven, let's say, or six years of age goes to school and is suddenly subjected to a culture which says that everything that that child's mother and father stand for, everything that's in his blood and in his hands, his whole being is second class and is to be thrown out. I hope all of you can sense that that is a fantastic psychological blow to a child. Some of you, I'm afraid, are not old enough yet to have children. But if you send a child to school for the first time and you are living in a lovely white neighborhood and you're well off and the child goes to a nice school, it's still frequently a trying, if not traumatic, experience for the child. Anybody who has seen anything has seen parents going down, shepherding their children to school, especially the first time they go. And very zealously talking to them when they come out to find out how it's going, to help them, to support them, to buttress them so that they will be able to get through this process of leaving the home. Why? Because we know it is a difficult thing for a child. But let's say when I took my child down to school at age six, he walked through the door, she walked through the door, and somebody smacked him on the face because they spoke English. What do you think happens to that kid? You know what happens. And that's what we've been doing internally in the country for a hundred years. Uh, we didn't do that maliciously. I'm not trying to condemn people, but that's what in fact happened. So that we practice this form of cultural imperialism internally in this country, similar to the cultural imperialism with, let's say, the French and the English practiced overseas. Ours was an internal colonialism. Theirs was external. We cluck, cluck, cluck our tongues about how terrible the British or the French were in their colonial exploitation over overseas, outside of France or England. But we did the same thing here. I'm not condemning them. I'm not condemning anybody. All I'm saying is we ought to wake up to it. We've still got a lot of it. Educational apartheid in addition to apartheid and justice. 20 years after the Brown case, we still have literally millions of minority group children not in integrated school surroundings. We've got all the rules. We've got the cases. We've got the technology. But the fact is we haven't solved the problem. And this applies not just to blacks. It applies to, again, Spanish-speaking people. And even when the schools are integrated, the educational theorists have been able to separate the kids after they get into school according to tracking systems, or homogeneous grouping, as they call it. There's lots of wonderful words like that, in which, in effect, segregation is achieved even in an integrated school. The most recent uh, national glorification is of the neighborhood school. I can remember that in Chicago in 1954, 55, and 56, we were all talking about the neighborhood school. Let me tell you something. My experience is that black people would be very, very happy if all of their children could go to, an edu to, a, uh, to a neighborhood school and didn't have to be bused, provided the school was worth going to. But what happens is that the school provided that the neighborhood of the ghetto isn't worth going to. So neighborhood school means one thing to us white people and another thing to other people. Let me shift to another extremely important part of the civil rights problem today. And I'm talking now about the bureaucratic barrier. What do I mean by that? Let me say that the president and the Congress and the Supreme Court and some cabinet people make what we might call macro political decisions. But the vast majority of decisions which are made in government are micro political decisions. And those decisions are made by bureaucrats. 
no matter what you want to call them, bureaucrats, civil servants, administrators, fellows like I was when I was in the government, we get huge grants of authority and we turn around and set up a group of people who actually make the life and death decisions which affect most people in this country. For example, in the energy crisis, what happens? Congress considers a law, very broad definitions, they pass it and say it's the president's job now to execute it. The president can't execute it. He's just got a broad grant, so he writes out a paper and says, Bill Simon, you execute it. Bill Simon's busy on uh, Meet the Press and the Today Show. Uh, he's got uh, 13 press conferences. He can't execute it, so he brings in a fellow named Sawhill. And Sawhill gets the job of doing what? Hiring a whole lot of people to execute it. Now, it's true. The theory is that all of us at the top make these policy decisions and everybody down the line follows them. But the reality is that there is a huge amount of discretion down the line. So the people at about the third or fourth or fifth level below Bill Simon, let alone below President uh, Nixon, make the actual decisions. What do I mean? They decide how much gasoline is going to come to South Bend. They decide who's going to get into federal housing if there is some in South Bend or Chicago. They decide what rent you're going to pay. They decide whether you're going to get job training if you're out of work or whether you're just going to be put on relief. They decide what kind of job training you're going to get if you get any. They decide by determining whether you're going to get job training for this profession or that profession, what your income's going to be. Not for tomorrow, but forever. Now, I'm not trying to say these are bad people, wicked people. I'm just trying to say that where the, policy, where the decisions are made that affect you and your families and the people in South Bend, Chicago, they're made by bureaucrats oper under, operating under big, broad grants of power. What does that mean? It means that we have the illusion in this country of three separate departments of government, you know, legislative, judicial, and the rest of it, and that that's where the, the decisions are made, and we blame our congressmen if something isn't done correctly. Pity the poor congressman. He can't make those decisions. I've had on numerous occasions somebody like Senator Fulbright say to me, God, he said, I'm just so, so discouraged. I can't get anything done. If Fulbright can't get anything done, what do you think you can get done? If he's discouraged at his lack of power to get something accomplished in the bureaucracy, what chance do we have? Practically none. So I maintain that one of the major executive department decisions that has to be made is that the bureaucracy has to be democratized. Now the fact is that the bureaucracy today is no more democratic after whatever it is, 50 years of civil service than it was before. We have an illusion, most of us, that these decisions are made by highly qualified civil servants who have passed a lot of merit examinations and who have a very neutral attitude toward everything and do everything exactly according to some book that's around somewhere. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Most of the jobs in the bureaucracy are gotten, as some of you know, I'm sure, not be on merit alone, not just on political patronage either the way it is, used to be, but from your friends. The way, if there's a job opening at the GS9 level in some department, who do you think applies for that? 98% of the people in America don't even know there's a job opening because there's no advertisement of that that amounts to anything. And anyhow, what happens, as my friend Derek Singer will tell you down in Washington, is that the fellow at the next desk tells his friend, hey, there's a job opening up over here. And that guy gets in. It's not on the basis of merit, therefore. It's on a basis, the old basis, who do you know? Now, once again, I'm not trying to just attack the bureaucracy. I'm trying to say two things. One, that the bureaucrats are making the decisions. Two, they're not elected by anybody. Three, they're not promoted on merit. And number four, they're not representative. For example, the Labor Department, God bless the Labor Department, it has about 30% minorities in their uh, ranks of employees and women. NASA has 4%. The Transportation Department, a new department, has got 6 What's happened is that certain departments, because the top man in the department was interested 
in equal opportunity, employment for minorities or for, or for women, have got a good record. And others where they didn't care or they thought their work was so important and so highly cerebral, let's say like NASA, they've got a terrible employment record. So when it comes to a question of executive action, we need a lot of executive action right now in the federal government, and we get zero. When was the last time you ever heard President Nixon, or Jerry Ford for that matter, or his predecessor, or anybody else, actually get up and talk about increased opportunities within the federal government? The only place you hear anything is from John Bugs out here at the Civil Service Commission, executive director. I think I asked John here not long ago, when was the last time he had heard anything from the White House about civil rights or equal employment increases? I think, I think you told me, John, yet you had never heard it at all. Father Hesburgh told me a wonderful story about President Kennedy. The inauguration parade went by all day long, the president's waving his hand and accepting the plaudits of the crowd. And after the parade was over, he walked in the White House and picked up the phone and called the Coast Guard Academy, asked for the commandant. Commandant, yes, Mr. President, how are you? Happy to hear your voice, Mr. President. And the president said, well, commandant, was, was that your contingent from the Coast Guard Academy that came by and there wasn't a single black member of the whole contingent? That's all that had to be done. Black people suddenly started going to the Coast Guard Academy. That's what we call executive leadership. That means that the man who's in charge has got eyes open for what's happening right in his own domain. And that does not exist in lots of the agencies of the federal government at this minute. And the bureaucracy reflects exactly what the leadership indicates. Let me give you another example of the power of the bureaucracy. Who do you think decides the budget? It's supposed to be the most single important instrument of government. Everybody thinks it's the president's budget. And it's true, the president sends it up to the Hill. And lots of the presidents, I'm sure President Nixon, worked very hard on it. But that budget is constructed by bureaucrats long before it ever gets to the president. Roy Ash, who never was elected anything. Matter of fact, he was in some people's minds sort of dropped out of being chairman of Lytton. He has more control over what's in that budget than anybody in the Congress. He's the fellow that fabricates that budget, helped by a lot of nameless Joes and Janes that never ran for anything. Now, once again, I'm not trying to attack them. I'm just trying to illustrate how the system works. When was the last time you ever heard anybody say we ought to have a black director of the budget? That's never been said. I think this is the first time it's ever been said, right now. <laughs> now, I'm not trying to say that if you had a black uh, director of the budget, that suddenly everything would be sweetness and light. I've known some terrific black people, and I know some that are not so good, too. Black people are like white people. We, you know, there's good and bad black people, as well as good and bad white people. But the permeation of the bureaucracy and of the leadership is, is, is white. Therefore, I recommend very, very strongly that one of the major places for civil rights action in the United States now and the immediate future is within the bureaucracy. We need to achieve a, what I call a representative democracy. So that if you remember that slogan of, um, I think it was uh, Abraham Lincoln, government of the people, by the people, all you have to do is add one word in there, government by all of the people. And all of the people ought to be in that part of the government which is exercising the most discretion and making the most rules, and that's the bureaucracy. First of all, for example, every government agency should be required to look over the people now on their payroll. 
and to do an analysis of that job and decide what kind of qualifications are really needed for that job. Let me give you a personal example of what I mean. My wife is very much interested in, in the mentally retarded. And the fact that 10 years ago, approximately, they couldn't get any jobs anywhere, practically speaking. And one night, we were commiserating about the fact that in the federal government, it was very difficult to get jobs at the grades 1, 2, and 3, get people to take jobs at grades 1, 2, and 3, although those jobs don't pay badly. Now, we called up John Macy and said, listen, why don't we start a program for hiring the mentally retarded through the civil service? John Macy is a terrific fellow. He started the program, and in one year, there was 10,000 mainly retarded people employed, employed in the civil service of the United States who never could have gotten in under the old requirements because they couldn't pass the test. Once they were in, every bureaucrat who had them working for them was delighted. They did terrific work. They got in only because somebody took the interest to look at the qualifications about the job and say, a mentally retarded person can do that job and do it very well. And it turned out they were excellent, excellent employees. That means analyzing the jobs. We need to have better recruitment. You can't get, quote, used to be, we would hire blacks, but there's no qualified blacks who apply. That's because nobody was out recruiting them or opening the door. We need that kind of a, an aggressive recruitment program in the bureaucracy. We need to have a program within the bureaucracy personnel system which will make sure that people are tested on the performance required for the job, not on requirements for uh, being the director of NASA. You have requirements for some jobs that nobody, unless they graduated with a PhD from the degree from Notre Dame, could possibly fulfill. But you don't really need that kind of a person in the job. And that's pervasive through the federal bureaucracy. We need to provide incentives for the managers of divisions within the bureaucracy that end up by having a good employment record with respect to minorities and blacks and women. And we need to have a penalty system for those who have wretched job performance in the employment of uh, blacks, minorities, and women. We need to have a philosophy that says political equality, every man one vote, is good, but social equality is just as essential. And that means job opportunities created in the executive branch for people who've got just as much right to these jobs as anybody else. So what can we do about it as an individual? I think in the middle of so many demands made upon us, I have so many wrong things that need to be righted, with a public philosophy to be formed and a bureaucracy to be reformed, many people are tempted to say along with Bob Kennedy, they begin to feel that there's nothing that one man or one woman can do against all the ills of the world against misery and ignorance and injustice and violence. We are tempted to see the futility of our own individual efforts. In recent years, we've seen a, a president killed who had inspired us. We've seen a war waged which dishonored us. We have witnessed a reign of violence in our politics. And now we watch a president trying to stay in the White House so he can stay out of jail. We decided to end poverty in America, and we still got it. We planted the seeds of a great society, and then our plowshares were beaten into swords. In whatever direction we moved to bend history in our way, history seemed to go its way. So many people decided that it was futile. And others began to find out that you could lead a very comfortable life without worrying about those things. You could graduate from law school, make a good income, you could become a doctor, an engineer, teacher, 
and get along very well without worrying about all these poor people or minority people. And why not just relax? Comfort in many places has replaced concern. But I continue to believe in my naivete that one man and one woman can make a tremendous uh, 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 contribution. Not only by adopting a philosophy that they're willing to live up to, but by encouraging others to do the same. In fact, by just acting on your beliefs, you can do a tremendous amount. That's what Rosa Parks did when she removed, refused to go to the back of the bus. I don't really believe, although I never knew her, I don't really believe that Rosa Parks sat at home one night and decided that she was going to start a civil rights revolution in America and then decided, well, now the way to do that is not to move to the back of the bus tomorrow. I think she just decided one day not to move to the back of the bus. I don't really believe that Martin Luther King, I think he was about 26, did a lot of cerebral homework and decided that the way to start a civil rights movement was to walk instead of riding the public transportation system in Montgomery. I think what happened maybe one night was that somebody was sitting around and some fellow said, well, let's all just walk tomorrow. And he started to walk, and then a few other people started to walk with him. He was putting his body and his feet into the fight. The most dramatic case I know of in recent times is the Watergate case. It's popular now to blame the media for the Watergate. Let me tell you something. There's only two people to blame outside of those on the inside. Two reporters, Bernstein and Woodward, on the Washington Post. Were they the editors of the Washington Post or the owners? They were not. Woodward was on his first journalistic story. He had the lowest job in the Washington Post that a reporter can have. He had to cover the police court. That's the guy that goes down around 2 o'clock in the morning and looks at the blotter to see who strangled whom, you know. <laughs> and usually write a thing this big, which most of the time doesn't get in the paper anyhow. He was out of the Marines. He never had had a job as a reporter. Woodward didn't say, boy, I'm going to get the Pulitzer Prize, hot dog, look at this. He was down there looking at the police blotter on June the 16th at 2 a.m. And he saw that some fellows had been arrested for breaking into the Democratic Party headquarters. And he and his sidekick, Bernstein, started to write the story. And they wrote the story. Not too many people paid too much attention. And there was a concerted effort, as we now know, to try to calm all this down. But uh, Bob Woodard and Carl Bernstein started to work. And they worked methodically by themselves, night after night, day after day, week after week, going from one person to the next person, to the next person, to the next person, interviewing each person whose name kept cropping up in the course of this case. That's what they were. There isn't anybody in this room that couldn't do the same thing tomorrow. If you want to do the work and you've got the energy or the desire or the self-starter. All that the ownership of the Washington Post did for them was to let them work. When the White House started attacking the post, the top level of the post, the top level of the post said, lay off these two reporters. It was months before anybody but Bernstein and Woodward was even put on the case. That's what two guys named Joe, so to speak, were able to do. And I've been over there in the Soviet Union a lot recently, as I said yesterday. And long before I was there a lot, this man Solzhenitsyn had captured my imagination. And I can tell you something about him. He didn't start out to win a Nobel Prize when he was a private in the Russian army. He didn't, when he was sent to a Stalinist labor camp and ate slop for eight years, 
He wasn't thinking, boy, this slop's good, you know, I'm going to write a terrific book about this. <laughs> that isn't what went on inside of that man when he was in the cancer ward of the hospital. All he ever did was try to be honest with himself and with the people with him and to the environment and to remember and report what he honestly saw, to observe you and to see how you reacted to see what was done to you, how the authorities behaved, what happened to your family, who got the job. He wasn't making moral judgment. He was a Stalinist, let's not forget that. He is a communist, let's not forget that. He is a Marxist, let's not forget that. He is a loyal, he thinks, Russian. He's not for us, against them. He just had the guts to report honestly what he saw and to be moved compassionately by the predicament of the human beings that he met. And from that compassion with these people, he created characters and situations which live. And this one man with no help, not even an electric typewriter, has caused such trouble that the world's greatest existing dictatorship and autocracy is trembling at what Solzhenitsyn's gonna say tomorrow. As if what one man said made any difference. Let me tell you, it makes one hell of a difference. There are thousands of Jews coming out of Russia tonight 10, 20, 30,000 a year now who wouldn't be coming out if it weren't for Solzhenitsyn. He has made a difference. He will make a difference. You can make a difference. Solzhenitsyn writes about the Gulag Archipelago. And God knows, let me tell you something, they even talk about that over there. I've talked to the fellows in the top of the KGB and they talk about the Gulag Archipelago to me now. But the Gulag Archipelago doesn't only exist over there. It exists here, in a ghetto, in a lonely Indian reservation, on the migrant labor trail, in the poor hollows of Appalachia. For white people, black people, all kinds of people, we have our own Gulag Archipelagos. And what I hope that will happen to all of you who are here in this Civil Rights Institute is that you will become convinced through your studies here and through the people who teach you and their example that you can help overcome our gulag archipelagos and that joined up you with people like Solzhenitsyn and there are many of them inside of Russia that you together with them can create a better world based as I've said on a belief that man is the greatest creation in this world. That one man is infinitely more powerful than all the hydrogen bombs put together. That one man, one woman, who blends and marries courage, moral courage, with intellectual intelligence, that one person who lives up to the combination of courage and intelligence can change the world. We're not all of us gonna win a Nobel Prize or a Pulitzer Prize or some other prize. But let me tell you, every time any one of us does something which is based on intelligence and courage and fidelity to the highest that is in you, you're going to make a difference in this world. You'll make a difference on the energy issue, the food issue, the population issue, the international monetary issue, the justice issue, the housing issue, the transportation issue. And all of those issues are waiting for the graduates of Notre Dame today to get out there and solve and conquer and to help create here the kind of a society which Jefferson and the rest of them dreamed about when they wrote the Declaration and the Constitution. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much, Mr. Shriver, for all that you've done and for being with us. Uh, your words uh, are inspiring, and they add to the contribution that these lectures hope we hope that they'll make to the uh, stimulation of interest in this subject that uh, so many of us feel shouldn't be neglected. It's been an honor to have you with us and have you deliver these lectures. And as a memento of that event, Father Hesburgh has uh, a little thing he'd like to give to you. Oh, it's Ed. Thank you, Frank. Sarge, as I told you, we've given you about everything we've got, but they've managed to dig up something we hadn't given you yet. And I think it, it speaks to the imagination, the creativity of our law school that they have done this. <laughs> I show it to the audience. It's a very nice plaque, and I'll read it. University of Notre Dame presented an appreciation to Sergeant Shriver, third annual civil rights lectures, March 1974, and signed. And Sarge, this comes with not just great appreciation and thanks for what you've done here these past two days, but with real thanks. Thanks, thanks very much, Bob. Appreciate it. In thanking Mr. Shriver and Mayor Hatcher, I think I should also thank the law school for initiating these lectures. I should thank Howard Glickstein and his staff for the marvelous conference they have organized these past two days in which we'll see a highlight in the dedication of the Civil Rights Center this evening and the talk of Justice Goldberg. And I think I should say that if we as a university community want to reach out to the world today with any one single ray, it would be a ray of hope. And I'm sure that all of you agree with me that listening to someone like Sergeant Shriver uh, talk about the great ideal that created us as a nation, uh, the great ideal that still uh, glimmers in the darkness that is so apparent throughout the world, that there is hope that something might be done about it each day, a new creation if only we can respond to the kind of leadership that has been put forth before you today. And for that inspiration and that message and all the effort it took to come and give it, I'd just like to say, Sarge, we're all deeply grateful to you and thank you very, very much. And you too, Mayor Hatcher, for coming and giving that wonderful introduction. Thank you all. We are adjourned.